Well, we're still in the book of Genesis. There's so much to talk about here in those first 11 chapters. Today, we're talking about this topic. Who are the sons of God in chapter 6? There's this very unusual passage in chapter 6 that causes a lot of confusion and misunderstanding. Today, we're going to straighten out this question, who are the sons of God? So I'll remind you now that we're looking at these first 2,000 years of Bible history uh, compacted into 11 chapters of the book when there was no Israel, no land, uh, law of Moses, no temple. There was also no cross of Christ. There was no gospel, no I mean, no one knew about Jesus as we know about him. It's quite an interesting time of 2,000 years and all packed into the first few chapters of Genesis. There's a, a lot of information in there. All right, so today I want to deal with one of the trickiest passages that people struggle with, and that's in Genesis chapter 6. This is the one that mentions the mysterious Nephilim, and not today, but in a future lesson where we'll talk about who are the Nephilim and what does that mean. Today we're going to ask, answer that question, who are the sons of God who are mentioned in this passage? Some English translations have the word giants in this passage. So what are the giants? Who are they? Not today. Again, that'll be in the next, in, 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 a, in a later one, but that's all going to be straightened out. And some of you may remember that this question was asked after one of my Genesis lessons. Hey, <laughs> what's with the Nephilim in Genesis chapter six? And I said, I'm getting to that one, but we had to cover other topics first. Okay. So just because there's confusion on this doesn't mean we can't understand it. In fact, we can by the usual method. Read the text in its context, as it was meant by its author to be understood by its original audience. When we do that, we can extract the primary objective meaning. It's the same method we use for everything. One method applied consistently to all of scripture. And when we do that, we get the right answers and all the pieces fit together perfectly. And that's what we're going to see today. Okay, so let me give you just a capsule summary of where I'm going with this. Basically, um, what I'm going to show from the scripture is this. This passage is not about giants. It's not about angels mating with women. It's about God's people in the line of Seth taking wives from the uh, ungodly people in the line of Cain. All right, now all that remains to be proven. So let's jump right in. So first of all, what is the context for this passage? Well, as always, the first audience so we have to set aside 3,400 years of, of ideas and mistakes and dissensions and confusion. Think like the original audience, their culture and language and history. We have to notice the place that it is in the book of Genesis. Right here in chapter 6, it's after the genealogies in chapter 5 of, of Seth's line, and just before the flood. So it's a transition from talking about those people and why the flood has to come upon the earth. So that's what we're expecting, and that's what we'll find. Now, one of the interesting things about doing reading a text in its context is every passage of Scripture has to be understood as the Bible being an, a progressively unfolding revelation. What that means is each new Scripture is given in the context of everything that came before it. So, for example, when we're reading the book of Joshua, you have to know about the previous five books, the, the Torah, the books of Moses, to understand what's happening in Joshua. Imagine someone reading Joshua who'd never read anything from the Bible before. They'd, they'd be utterly confused. W who are these people? Why are they hurting those Canaanites? Are, you know, what's going on here? Who's Joshua? You have to, it is assumed when you read Joshua that you know about the previous five books. That's the context. The New Testament context is everything that came before. That's the Old Testament. And when I was teaching on the book of Revelation, it was really easy because all the other books are potential context to understand Revelation. And notice this, since Genesis is the very first book, every other book has Genesis as its context. And that's why it's so important to get this right. Genesis is foundational. A small error there in the beginning can result in huge problems at the end. That's the butterfly effect. Now, when we come to this passage in Genesis chapter 6, what's the context? Well, only what came before, the first five chapters. So when we read it in context, to understand what it means, we have to demonstrate that from the previous five chapters. You can't go anywhere else for context. 
Now we can look at the rest of the Bible for confirmation, but even when we do that, the nearer passages, the ones that are close by, are going to have more force than th something that's far away. So what is revealed in Genesis after chapter 6 as confirmation is going to be of a, a higher priority than anything outside the book of Genesis. And of course, we also have the Torah being a single unit. Uh, all five books of Moses were stitched together and rolled up on a, a single scroll. So that's also an important uh, a bit of context because the Torah is a single unit. All right. So as I was saying, you know, we see that uh, the, in the previous lesson, we talked about the conflict of the seed. The two um, genealogies, that of Cain and that of Seth, are right back to back so that you'll compare and make uh, comparisons and contrasts between the two. And the story that we're about to read here in Genesis chapter 6 is telling us what happened to those people and why the flood is coming on the earth. All right, so let's go read the passage. I'm going to show you um, a, a translation since this is controversial. I'm going to use my own translation directly from the Hebrew. Hebrew. It's a very straightforward, literal kind of translation. Here's what the passage says. And it was that when mankind became many on the face of the ground and daughters were born to them, then the sons of God said, saw that the daughters of Adam were good and they took to themselves wives from any they chose. And Yahweh said, My spirit will not abide in mankind unto the ages, because he also is flesh, and his days shall be a hundred twenty years. Okay, so we see this passage. Now I've uh, highlighted some things here to call your attention to. Where it says mankind in, in, in English, that literally says Adam in the, in the, uh, in the Hebrew. So Adam being the original, you know, the prototype for, for mankind and the name from which it comes. And we also remember, I told you before, the word Adam comes from the word for ground, Adama. So you see, it says Adam became many on the ground, not on, in the land or on the earth. That's, that's done on purpose. It's designed to call your attention to the previous chapters. Remember when Adam was made from the earth? Oh, yeah, yeah. That was previously, right? So it's, it's making you, it's a callback to get you thinking about the prior chapters. Now, notice this other part right here where it says in uh, that of the sons of God, they took to themselves wives from any they chose. Now, what's interesting about this is that we have the same pronoun mentioned three times in this very short passage. That's highly unnecessary. It's it's unnecessary repetition, and it calls attention to you itself. This is done on purpose. We saw something similar in the book of Samuel, because we had this statement when the people chose a man for their king instead of God. Samuel told them, when you cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, Yahweh won't answer you. So you see, again, the triple pronoun, your king, who you chose for yourselves. That is being to em uh, used to emphasize that they were choosing in opposition to what God wanted. The same thing is true here in Genesis 6 of the sons of God. So this them, they, them, they, them, they, they took for themselves any they chose. is to emphasize that they're choosing in opposition to what God wants. So that's not anything that sons of God should be doing. It's an act of rebellion and sin. Well, have we, haven't we seen this before? Yes, we saw this before. It's a re repeating motif, the, an event or a pattern that happens again to call attention to itself. This is the primeval sin. Primeval meaning the first in history. The same one that Adam and Eve committed. And we had a whole lesson about the primeval sin. But let me just give you a quick reminder of what that was in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve took of the apple, this is what it says. When the woman saw that the tree was good, then she took of its fruit. And this was the first sin. And this is the, the pattern that's established that we're seeing happen again here in Genesis chapter six. And when it says it was that it was good, this is what God is supposed to do, right? In Genesis chapter one, when he creates, God saw the light that it was good. It is God who determines what's good, not man. But in this case, the woman is determining what's good. That's the primeval sin. 
And these three keywords, to see and the good and to take, become a fingerprint that marks off certain passages as being a repetition of this primeval sin. And this is exactly what we see in Genesis chapter 6, the same thing. It says, the sons of God saw that the daughters were good, and they took them as wives. So those three, same three words in the same exact order are indicating that this is a repeating, um, a repeat, a repeat of the primeval sin. It's happening again. These people are doing what Eve did. And of course, since it's the sin of mankind, which comes down through the line of descent, through their genealogy, then the sons of God must also be men because they're repeating the sin of men, which is inherited by men. Now, we all have that same propensity to sin. Is, is, we're capable of that. For those of us who have come to faith in Christ, we have the Holy Spirit to help us overcome it, but the corruption of sin remains in our flesh, and we're always in that battle against, against it, you know, and we've inherited also from our forefathers. And when I talked about the primeval sin, we discussed that. Okay, I'm going to come back to the sons of God, but first I want to finish the passage that we read where God says, my spirit shall not abide in man, his days shall be 120 years. What does that mean? That's, that's a strange thing to say, and there's some confusion about it. Um, some people think that what it's teaching is that God set a limit on the age which people can attain. To only they, no one can be older than 120 years. Is that what it means? You'll hear teachers say this. Well, no, that's not what it means. And here's a simple way to disprove it. Meet Jean-Louise Calmont. She is the Guinness record holder for the oldest person to ever live, whose age is verified. She was born in 1875, died in 1997. We have her birth certificate uh, there on the screen. So we know for certain that she lived to be 122. And you see in the picture on the right, she's celebrating her 121st birthday. By the way, Jean-Louise was a smoker. Oh my gosh. The oldest person living smoked. And how terrible is that for people who have lost a loved one at a very young age to smoking that the oldest person was able to get away with it. But anyways, it does prove that God did not make a decree that no one can live past 120. Otherwise, Jean-Louise has overcome God's power. No, that's not what it's teaching. This is actually another repeating motif so that we, again, from Genesis 1 five, through 5, the, the context of this passage, so we can know what's going on. Let me show you that because it's, it's found in Genesis 5 in the genealogies. We read this, for example, thus all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. Now, this statement is, is said for each one of the people in the, in the genealogy. All the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. And thus, all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. So it establishes a pattern. All the days of X are so many years, and he dies. So what's happening now in Genesis 6 is God says this of mankind. All the days of mankind will be 120 years, and then, and then what? And then he will die in the flood. Yes, it's saying the time until the flood is 120 years. Now notice also this. This death sentence is declared on mankind as a whole. It's a punishment that's coming on all. Now we know that Noah and his family were saved by getting on board the ark. They were saved from the flood of God's wrath. And Jesus specifically tells us that his second coming will be just like that in the days of Noah. There is a flood of God's wrath that's coming on all the earth at the, on the last day, but we can be saved from it by getting on board the ark. Jesus is the ark who saves us from the flood of God's wrath. So this story of Noah's ark is a type and shadow of Jesus Christ. So when you see that big boat, or when you think about it, Noah's Ark is a symbol for Jesus. And how magnificent that is, because it's so big. If you get a chance to go see the recreation that's in Kentucky, Nadine and I highly recommend it. We've been there, uh, had a great time. 
And one of the things I find fascinating about it is we Christians don't build monuments, you know, giant statues like the, the Greeks did to their gods. But this enormous boat, in a way, is a symbol for Jesus. And just the sheer size of it kind of uh, attempts to capture some of the majesty that is uh, Jesus, our Lord and our God. It's hard to imagine anything that could uh, symbolize Jesus. It, it really still isn't big enough, but um, we do have the ark and Jesus is, is our ark. All right. So when we put together everything that we've just looked at for Genesis chapter six, we see the following things are, are true. Mankind became many. The sons, God, the sons of God committed the primeval sin, which is a sin of mankind, the one Adam and Eve did. And as a result, a devastating judgment comes on mankind. So you see, the scope of the passage is all about mankind, and that tells us that the sons of God are mankind. They are people. They're not, um, they're not angels or, or anything else, as some people will say. Now we're going to ask, why are they called the sons of God? Well, we have to find the answer in our context, right? Genesis 1 through 5, that's where it's proven from. Some people will say, oh, this phrase, sons of God, appears in the book of Job. And over there, it's talking about angels. Yeah, that's right. But we're not in the book of Job. <laughs> to suggest we should take this passage out of Genesis and put it in Job, and if it were over there, maybe it'd mean angels. Okay. But then you've taken it out of context, right? It doesn't belong there. It belongs here. So we have to find out who are the sons of God in the book of Genesis, so let's see where that is, because we, we do find that in Genesis 1 through 5. It's right here in chapter 5. This is what it says. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. And then, in verse 3, when Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. Now notice in that first verse, it says, God made man in his image. Well, we knew that. That was back in Genesis 1.27. Does the author think that we forgot after four chapters? No. Again, it's a callback because it's being, there's a, an explicit parallel being made between these two, in these two passages. Let me show it to you graphically. God makes man and has in, in his image and likeness, we get Adam. When Adam has a son, it's in his image and likeness, a, the likeness of Adam is Seth. So the relationship here is that just as Seth is the son of Adam, so Adam is the son of God. And in fact, the Bible actually says this in Luke chapter 3, in the genealogy of Jesus, it says Adam was the son of God. So that's what this passage in chapter 5 is, is making that parallel by which we know that Adam was a son of God. So this concept of son of God, man being sons of God, is right there in the context for our Genesis 6 passage. Now, Adam, when he was first made, was the son of God. He was joined with God. They had communion. God walked and talked among them. But because Adam and Eve disobeyed and rebelled against God, they were cursed and sent out of the garden away from the presence of God. So they became fallen people. So in the book of Genesis, Adam represents this fallenness, this being disconnected from God, even though he was originally the son of God. Now, we can be rejoined to God by faith in him, and it's the same. It was true in those days. People who put their faith in God were rejoined to God. Now, we, when we find uh, in, at the end of Genesis chapter 4, it says of Seth and his family, at that time, he began to call upon the name of Yahweh. We know that all who call upon the name of Yahweh will be saved. So Seth and his family were, had devoted themselves to God. And so they became sons of God, just like we are sons of God. So this is kind of amazing. We're connected with those people because they were sons of God, just like we are by faith in God. And we are now we are God's people. They were God's people. Now, at the time, there was no Israel. There was no church, at least in name. But these people were a proto-Israel, a proto-church. 
And we can see them as part of the universal church of which all believers are part throughout time and space history, in the past and in the, in the future. Question is, what does proto? A proto-Israel is a like a prototype, a, an initial something that's like what's going to be, but it hasn't happened yet, right? A, they're, they're like an Israel, even though the name Israel isn't used. They're like a church, even though the word church wasn't used in that time. Now, we also have, not only do we have some sons of God, sons and daughters of God, those who join themselves to God, but we have in the line of Cain, those who reject God. Remember, we looked at the line of Cain, and we talked about the conflict of the seed, these two lines, and the, the, the Cainites have become evil, like the evil Lamech we saw, who was a murderer and a bigamist, because they've remained separate from God. Therefore, because they're reflecting the nature of fallen Adam, they would be sons and daughters of Adam. So in our passage in Genesis 6, when it talks about the sons of God, those are God's people in the line of Seth, and the sons and daughters of Adam being fallen are the people in the line of Cain who have separated themselves from God. Now, we can confirm that this use of son of God is how the Torah speaks by looking at some other interesting passages in the Torah. For one thing, at Exodus chapter 3, when, when God meets Moses at the burning bush, he says, Israel is my firstborn son. So Israel, this, the nation, is the son of God, and those are people. In Deuteronomy, uh, Moses gives the people, um, it says this to the people, Deuteronomy 14.1, you are the sons of Yahweh, your God. You shall not cut yourselves or make any baldness on your foreheads for the dead. So look what he says. You are the sons of God. You are the sons of Yahweh. So we find this concept in the Torah. This is how it speaks of sonship. In another chapter, this is Deuteronomy 32, the song of Moses. He sa it says this, they have dealt corruptly with him. They are no longer his children. Do you thus repay the, repay the Lord, you foolish and senseless people? Is not he your father who created you and who made you and established you? You were unmindful of the rock that bore you, and you forgot the God who gave you birth. Yahweh saw it and spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and his daughters. So in these several passages, it indicates that God's people, Israel, are his children, he is, they're his sons and daughters. He is their father, and he gave birth to them. So it sets up this relationship and confirms that we're reading Genesis 6 right. Sons of God is God's people. Now, let me ask you this about this particular passage. Were they being obedient when God rebukes them in this way? No. And yet they're still called God's people, sons of God and daughters of God. And what we're going to see in Genesis 6 is, they were choosing for themselves that sinful behavior and yet are still called sons of God because they are the ones who had devoted themselves to God, even though they were now acting sinfully. Unfortunately, they were acting sinfully. Okay, and then there's one more passage in Deuteronomy where we have the exact phrase, the sons of God, exactly the way it's, it's written in, in Genesis 6. It's verse 7. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show, your, show you your elders and they will tell you. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. So there it is, the sons of God. Well, who's being talked about in this passage? Well, it's something that happened in olden days, many generations ago, when God divided mankind into nations. Those And the number that was used is the sons of God. So what is this referring to? Well, it's Genesis chapter 10, after the Tower of Babel. Here's this quote from uh, Genesis chapter 10, verse 5. From these the nations were divided in their lands, each with his own language by their clans in their nations. So this is when the nations were divided. God confused their language at the Tower of Babel, causing them to disperse over the earth, and there were 70 different nations created at that time, and the names are given in Genesis chapter 10. They're the grandchildren of Noah, Shem, uh, the children of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And if you go online, you can find yourself a, a, a nice map 
search on Genesis 10 or Table of Nations, and you'll find these maps, like the ones I'm showing you, where it shows where the nations went. Now, because of the names of certain cities or um, people groups, we have a good idea where a lot of these are, but not a perfect idea. Some of them are guesses. Here's a map that has even more. But again, there are 70 nations that were divided, the sons of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And you can see this guy, I think he's trying to cram them all into one chart, which is great, but hard to read. So in this Deuteronomy 32 passage that I said, it calls those grandsons of Noah the sons of God. Why is that? Because they're the people who devoted themselves to God, even though they weren't all faithful. After the flood, all the wicked had been destroyed. So everyone left was the sons of God. All right. Now, there in this Deuteron Deuteronomy passage, there's a manuscript variant. Some manuscripts say sons of Israel. Does that work? No. Uh, Israel hadn't been born yet, first of all. And there was only 12 sons, not, not 70. So that doesn't work. In the Septuagint, which is not a manuscript, but a translation into Greek, it says the angels of God. Well, were, were the nations divided according to the number of angels? No. How many angels are there? Well, Jesus, for example, said he could summon 12 legions of angels. Uh, a Roman legion is 6,000 fighting men. 12 times 6,000 is 72,000 angels that Jesus had at his uh, summons. Well, it wasn't divided into 72,000, so it can't be that. So we can be sure that the original text was sons of God, and it's referring to the people in Genesis 1 through 11, exactly where we are in looking in Genesis chapter 6. And by the way, the word nations first appears in Genesis 10. It's never used before that. Okay, so all of this helps us understand who the sons of God are. They're the men in the tribe or the people in the um, line of Seth. And, you know, that's what the context, Genesis 1 through 5, tells us. And we have the confirmation from elsewhere. The teaching, which I'm trying to say is wrong, says we go to the book of Job. Well, no, that's out of context. It's a remote uh, context, not a local one like the Torah. Uh, it's a different section, wisdom literature, not, not history. It's a different genre, mostly poetry. You don't read poetry to find out how prose works. And it's somewhat arbitrary. I mean, why go to Job? Why not go to the Psalms? You know, in, in the Psalms, God says of his anointed, you are my son. So why not think that the sons of God are all the anointed, the, the leaders, you know, prophets, priests, kings, and judges, things like that. There are actually some teachers who say that the sons of God in Genesis 6 does refer to the leaders of God's people. Well, no, because the context, I mean, that's, again, it's the wrong context. It's, it's remote context, and it's, it's completely arbitrary. Why pick one or the other? What we've seen is that in the Torah, the, the, the idea of sons of God always refers to God's people. It refers to humans, not to angels. And when we do see angels in the Torah, they're always called by that name or, or one similar. For example, in our context, Genesis 1 through 5, God set a guard over the Garden of Eden to prevent, prevent them from coming back. What did, who did he put there? The cherubim. Those are angels. It doesn't say he put the sons of God to guard the way to the Garden of Eden. When the angels come to the city of Sodom and Gomorrah to meet up with Lot, it says there were two angels. It just calls them angels. It doesn't say sons of God. And when a Jacob is met by angels, it says he was met by the angels of God, not the sons of God. So now from all this, we understand how the book of, Tor of the Torah refers to angels and how it refers to God's people as the sons of God. Okay, so let's talk about why they're called the sons of God. I guess I kind of have already answered that question. Well, uh, let me just say this. In choosing wives for themselves from the other tribe, they were disobeying God. And so just like Israel wasn't all faithful, these sons of God in Genesis 6 are all not all faithful. But whenever God's people who have devoted themselves to God get to a point where there's more disbelief or a certain amount, whichever one, you know, whatever God's threshold is, he acts to separate the two groups and bring destruction on the faithless majority and vindication on the believing remnant whom he protects. And so this believing remnant now then becomes the totality of God's people. So for example, when they're taken into exile 
and the city of Jerusalem is destroyed, mostly the faithless majority are killed or enslaved, whereas the believing remnant go into captivity where God nurtures them until they come back to the land of Israel and repopulate it. And that's just how God works. And so what we're seeing in the flood, though, is that these sons of God in, in, in committing the primeval sin and disobeying in rebellion against God, it's gotten to the point where there's no godly people left. So God is going to act to destroy the faithless majority and, and save the believing remnant, which is Noah and his family, eight people through the ark, which survives the flood. Okay, another concern why is it wrong to choose wives? <laughs> well, it's not the choosing of your own wife. That's a problem. But it's wrong for God's people to choose Gentile wives, and it always ends up making God's people less holy and less faithful to God. Here's an illustration. Imagine a garment that's used for the high priest, this white linen. It's the whitest linen available to them. It's 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 made and it's perfectly flawless. They keep it in the temple so it never gets exposed. The, the high priest only wears it on holy days three times a year, and he washes head to toe before he puts this garment on, so he's, he's fully clean. And after he takes it off, it's put back in the temple, spot cleaned by hand. It is the cleanest, most holy gar garment in all the land. Now, if some thieves break in and they're running away, and as they run, the guards chase them, they drop the garment. It falls into the mud. Let me ask you this. If the holy garment falls into the mud, does the mud become clean? Does the mud become holy or does the garment get stained and defiled so that it can no longer be used by the priest? And of course, in those days, they could never have gotten it white again. Now, what if the thieves get away and they take it to the land of the Philistines and the high priest of Dagon... The false god puts on this thing and does pagan sacrifices in the temple of Dagon. Does the priest and the temple become holy? Or does the garment become defiled so that the high priest of Israel says, like, I can't wear that anymore? This is always what happens when God's people join themselves to the ungodly people. When the sons of God who have devoted themselves to God take wives from the line of Cain, the wicked people, that influence of the wives draws the, the godly people away and defiles them. And we see this over and over in Scripture, again, for confirmation as we look through the rest of the, the, the Bible. Let's look at some of those. Here's the warning that Moses gives in Exodus. Take care, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land to which you go, and you take of their daughters for your sons, and their daughters whore after their gods and make your sons whore after their gods. And of course, what happens exactly that? In Numbers chapter 25, we have the incident of Baal at Paor. When Israel lived in Shittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. These invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel yoked himself to Baal of Paor, and the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel. So exactly what he said not to do, they did. They gave their sons to the daughters, and the, the sons, the holy people, became defiled. We have several examples of this. You know, that prohibition I just read you, the incident of Baal at Peor. And then Moses gives them another prohibition in Deuteronomy 7. Right? That's the younger generation. After Joshua dies, in the time of the judges, during the judgeship of Othniel, they do it again. They take foreign wives, and the same thing results. King Solomon's wives, right? He had all those wives. They drew his heart away from God, and he did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh because he was married to foreign women. Shouldn't have done that. Even the returned exiles, <laughs> they're supposedly all cleaned up, right? And they do it in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, but at that point, they turn away their foreign brides, and they turn away God's wrath as a result. So we have this prohibition even in our day. In 2 Corinthians 6.14, it says this, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? So the same principle, which is being taught in this passage in Genesis chapter 6, 
about mixing with the unholy people and becoming defiled by it is still true for us and is taught in the New Testament. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. One way to be yoked is to marry the unbelievers or the wicked people um, because it always draws the holy away and we become defiled. Remember in the previous lesson, I talked about the world system of which Satan is the God. And uh, there's a prohibition. We're told, keep yourself unstained from the defilements of the world. Well, when we yoke ourselves, when we tie our lives, knit our lives together with unbelievers in a way that will draw us away from God, we're tempting fate and we're following the example of these wicked people, these sons of God in the line of Seth. We shouldn't be doing that. Now, that doesn't mean we don't talk to unbelievers. We don't uh, hang out with them and be friends with them, but we don't knit our lives together and, and give them the kind of influence over us that would draw us away from God. So this, again, is a repeating motif. The marriage to the foreign women, which results in the holy seed of Israel, or God's people generally, becoming defiled. And what we're seeing here is the, the Genesis 6 incident is the very first one. It is the prototype of which all the, fu the future ones are the repetition. So it establishes the motif that we then recognize as it happens when other people of God marry foreign wives and are drawn away. And it results in the harshest of punishments, the, the, um, the flood, the flood of Noah's day. And of course, this is also a re repeat of the, um, the cycle of apostasy that we saw. You may remember I showed you the cycle of apostasy, where after the initial creation, there is the fall and the curse, the judgment of the curse on creation. But then mankind gets stuck in this loop. God redeems him. There's a new creation, but then there's another new fall and a new judgment. And back round and round and round we go. And this is the cycle of Old Testament history. And the only way we can break out of this cycle is by Jesus Christ, who brings the final redemption, the last new creation, and it never get, again needs to be repeated. And we are part of that new creation. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17. We are that new creation, and it's the last one. There's not going to be another. Right? And in uh, Paul, at one point, he says, of the things that happened to the people in the Old Testament, these are written for your instruction. This is to teach us. Don't commit that sin. Don't be yoked to unbelievers. Don't do what the sons of God did in Genesis chapter 6. You, who are now sons of God, by faith in Jesus Christ. So I think it's amazing how we're connected to these people, how this story is still relevant to us today. It is a warning that we need to take to heart. It was written for our instruction. So what we're seeing in this passage is the sons of God, those who have devoted themselves to God, who are in the line of Seth, have taken daughters of the, the, the unbelievers and yoked themselves to them. That caused them to become defiled. And when a certain threshold had been reached, God brought the destruction on the earth. And that's what's happening in, in the passage. And it's, it's amazing when you unpack it, how it just fits with everything else and it matches its own context and everything comes together. So let me summarize what we've just heard and, and give you some conclusions. What do we learn from this passage? Well, for one thing about how to read scripture in context and what not to do, don't take it out of context. And that we should be on the lookout for things like this triple uh, pronoun, this, this unnecessary repetition that we see. It calls it your attention. You should stop and look. Uh, one of my seminary professors would say this, ask questions of the text, right? Why, why, is, why are there three pronouns? That you could have rewritten that. It'd be a lot more efficient. Why are you reminding us of something you, we already knew from chapter one? Did you think we'd forget? No, there's a reason for it. It's all purposeful. And of course, we want to avoid taking things out of context, twisting the scripture. Instead, read it as the original audience would have. All right. Another thing we learn is that God did not limit human lifespans to 120 years, but that was just the time from that decree until the 
the time of the flood, which was the sentence of death coming on mankind. The same one that, as I said, remember, that's what Jesus said, there's a, a flood of God's wrath coming on the end of history. So that's a warning for us. That's a warning that we can teach other people about. Now's the time to get right with God because that flood is coming just like in, in Noah's day. Another thing we learn is that the sons of God in Genesis ch uh, chapter six are humans in the line of Seth. They're God's people, just as we were God's people, a proto-Israel, a proto-church. And their example of disobedience is a lesson for us. Whenever you choose in opposition to what God would have you choose, that's rebellion, that's sin. And you could find yourself committing the primeval sin and like Adam and Eve sent away from God or having that flood of God's wrath come upon you. We don't want to do that because we can still engage in that, that kind of sin and have God's wrath kindled against us. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we confess our sins. Okay, so that's who the sons of God are. I haven't even gotten to the Nephilim and the giants. That's coming up in a future lesson. So I hope you can rejoin us then, and we'll find out all about that. I hope this message has blessed you. Now I'd like to hear your comments and or questions. Thank you. Okay, if the men weren't supposed to marry the foreign women then, what changed that? I think perhaps there's a confusion about the word foreign. Uh, in, in, in the Bible, when God is talking about foreign or strange women, that means the ungodly women. It's, it's, well, I, I guess for Israel, they were also not normally supposed to marry outside their nation. But then again, God had always intended that all the Gentiles would be, be grafted in. So it's not the idea of uh, foreign is not the problem. It's not that they're foreigners. It's that they're, they're godless people. Right? There, were, there was the possibility for people to become proselytes. They could join the Israelite nation. God had said, you'll have one law for the people and for the stranger who lives among you. So, and, and we see examples like Ruth, the Moabites, right? Which the book of Ruth mentions several times, Ruth the Moabites, as if you'd forget. It's, it's only four chapters long. It's a reminder that this woman was a Gentile. She was not a member of Israel, yet she's a godly woman who devotes her life to Yahweh she makes a great wife and she makes a great example of faith in the Bible to all of us, even though she's a Gentile. So, you know, the problem, Boaz didn't do wrong in marrying uh, Ruth the Moabites because she was a godly woman. The problem is marrying ungodly people. And that's still a situation. Do not be un unequally yoked to unbelievers, not foreigners. You know, it's not about that. It's unbelievers. Does that, does that help? Yes, it does. It's the godly people we need to be with, not the right. ungodly. A amen. Thank you. Okay, good question. 